Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Halal Gap. I'm your host, Sophia Alani, and today's episode is brought to you by my favorite and only co-host, Sikandar Atik. If you guys have enjoyed our episodes of The Halal Gap so far and want to make sure not to miss the next one, please follow us on Apple, Spotify, and Stitcher and leave us a review. If you're watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe to our channel. We have an incredible guest joining us today. Take it away, Sikandar. He's a stand-up comedian and rising star who's been featured on Just for Laughs, CBC Next Up, and all over your For You page on TikTok. He's open for the likes of Hasan Minhaj and Namesh Patel and just filmed his first special in his home city of Toronto. He also happens to be a former PacWest Championship Tournament All-Star. Joining us from right here in Edmonton, please welcome Hassan Phils. Hassan or Hassan? What do you prefer? Uh, I think Hassan. Hassan? Hassan. All right. I know, but I know the Desi community, they go Hassan. That's why I got to... I gotta, I gotta, but I got I gotta, two S's. Okay. Well, I mean, two S's in the Daisy community, I think, would still go Hassan. Is, uh, yeah. But Hassan is uh, is what we will go by today because oh, yeah. I want to make sure I get your name right. <laughs> I have a track record of butchering people's names on mm-hmm. the podcast, so I'm going to I'm gonna try to make sure I don't do that today. Oh, but, you're uh, good. You're good. Yeah. All right, man. So with all of our guests, we like to start right at the beginning. Before you were a comedian, you were a pretty prolific basketball player. Mm-hmm. So where did your love of the game come from? Where, what inspired that? Uh I think I like I just like socializing. You know, a lot of my friends they play basketball, um, and then in order to kind of like fit in during recess and uh, fit in during recess and just I like the aspects of just being in a team. Yeah, yeah. A team was like a team was like the first community I was a part of, Mm -hmm. and then yeah, man, I like competition. That was the first thing I probably like exercise. That's the first sport. I ever exercised like resolve and mm-hmm. like uh, discipline and practice. Yeah, 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 yeah. So a lot of a lot of that came from basketball. So I like that's why I admire it. Yeah, man, right on. Do you see it as like sports in general? Was it something that you saw as an avenue for for something bigger when you were young? Like, were you like, I want to be in the NBA when I grow up, or was it more so like you said, just kind of for the social aspect of it? Of course, man. I, it it gives you that optimism, right? Mm-hmm. Early optimism. Ah, the NBA, and if not the NBA, then D one. If not D one, then 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 post secondary somewhere in this right. high school. But there's this, at least something to work towards yeah, you know, yeah, with yeah. sports, yeah. and yeah, it's very pivotal for me. Was it was it something that? Um... Is you you've spoken a lot of in in some of your comedy about your your parents one being from Djibouti one from Jamaica yeah, yeah. It w- was that something that they were pushing you into like I know for me growing up like I, I was a hockey guy not a basketball uh-huh. guy, but like you know my dad liked to watch you never want to take me to games uh-huh. um, you go with your coach or something was it something your parents like bought into or was it a little more foreign for them as well oh uh, no they were all for it anything I actually showed the slightest enthusiasm for it. Yeah, yeah. And took a little bit of initiative. My mom was like, go for it. And my father, same thing. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. That so even with cool. comedy too, it was, the, it was like, all right, man, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So where, where did that love come from, comedy? Was that also something that you were drawn to at an early age? Oh, uh, so when I was like maybe 15, yeah. uh, f- 14 or 15, somebody gifted me like an iPod. My very first one. And I wasn't even like a music enthusiast or at all. Yeah. I was just like, if it was playing around me, I'd listen to it, radio, whatever. And um, someone gifted me an AirPod, uh, an iPod. And again, at my crib, I didn't have a, a computer, yet alone iTunes, you know, mm-hmm. uh, to, to in, or internet, actually, <laughs> <laughs> to, to even put music on my shit. So I, I ended up... Uh, I gave it to one of my friends. Music. I figured like, oh, he's a music. And I like whatever you like. Yeah. So yeah. put whatever is on yours on mine. And for some reason, this guy had a bunch of like comedy albums on <laughs> his thing. So he had like uh, uh, some uh, some. He had the Delirious by Eddie Murphy. Yeah. Uh, Killing me softly, or Killing them softly by Dave Chappelle. Yeah. And a few others. And I, when I started playing basketball a little bit more seriously through like AU tournaments and. Uh, rap basketball, you're doing these long ass commutes, you know, driving mm-hmm. five, six hours across the border, and everybody was listening to music in the car. Yeah. And I'm there just listening to this Dave Chappelle killing me comedy <laughs> albums in the whip the whole time. I'm in the back just laughing. That's amazing. They're like, yo, what are you listening to? I say, yo, listen to, and I'm listening to Dave Chappelle, and, and I guess like midway through the special, they don't even know what's going on. So they're like, ah, okay, I don't get it. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. But I'm there just having a time. And actually, I ended up watching 
I listened to that special more times than I've watched it. The Dave Chappelle one specifically? Yeah. Wow. That's interesting because not a lot of people get introduced to, I mean, maybe I shouldn't say not a lot of people, but I feel like a lot more people might get introduced to comedy through like the visual medium rather than like the audio medium. Did you find that when you finally watched it, did you look at it from a different perspective? Like the physical aspect of it? Mm -hmm. was, I didn't even like, I was watching the Chappelle show. Yeah. Separately. Yeah. And honestly, I didn't know that. Sh I, it took me like maybe a few months to, Put it together like, oh, it's this is Dave Chappelle. This is the same comic. <laughs> I said, like, what the hell? Yeah, man. It was, it was, it was. Uh, I enjoyed that a lot, man. I some, you know, when you when you hear somebody uh, is starting to watch like Game of Thrones for the first time and it's already been like out for so long. Yeah. And you're like, oh man, I wish I could be you. You know, I could wish yeah, I could yeah, yeah, watch yeah. that moment. Now, when I think about like that, listening to that comedy album. Or listen to that special. Sometimes I think about that. Like, oh, I wish I could remember listening to the first time. Yeah. Driving to Cleveland for my first time. And I'm in the car just listening to it. Takes you right back. Takes me back, yeah. Wait, wait, I mean, you said something that's pretty interesting, which is like when you're watching the show, you didn't even recognize that it was the same guy who's doing the actual comedy special when you're just like listening to it. What, how do you, like, what do you think about that kind of dynamic between like the stage performance versus like the scripted television actor you know like is that something that as you're starting to get more and more involved in comedy and as you started to like you know get more involved with people who are in the scene for for quite some time is that like a dynamic that you feel like you have more of an affinity to like i know right now you do mostly just you, you do mostly the stand-up mm -hmm. but is that something that you also think that you want to get involved with is like on the, on the screen for sure yeah i would love to man and um i think comedy stand-up at least is like an avenue towards it yeah but i i i i tried acting man acting is harder than it looks man what did you do uh awesome. like i've done like commercials here awesome. and there. where is it in, oh yeah you are in a commercial i did get that in my yeah, yeah yeah, yeah. But anything, anything like uh like fiction like scripted TV no or I, i've done like i've done extra work okay which was like i heard this is long hours long hours you're like you're like a sheep yeah. and and they just cattle they there's like shepherd you yeah. whenever they need you and you know, at first when you're just like you know you need some money and you're just hanging out it seems like a really good time yeah but then afterwards, it turns into like, okay, this is... The What's the most random extra work you've done? I was on this show C uh, with we'll Jason Momoa. Okay. It's like an Amazon Prime oh, show. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Where yeah. like everybody's like blind uh, except for Apple him. Apple TV, right? Yes, yeah, on yeah, Apple yeah, yeah. TV, Come yes. On, bro. You got you to gotta know the shows, yeah, man. <laughs> I served my time, man. I got my... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, man, it was funny because we did training for that. Like they... yeah, it's, like, uh, it's like you're in like the forest or some shit, right? Yeah, like, man. Okay, okay. We did like a boot camp where they trained us on how to be these blind warriors. Oh my god! It was ridiculous. How, man, long, but how it, long was the boot camp for? All the boot camp was like, hey, I got paid for eight hours, man. I was there for four. <laughs> Loved it. That's, uh, that's, that's, but that's it was so like, yeah, they chose like C, Sa, So. I don't know what it was. They was just yelling out phrases. So I think like C was like, like I don't know, like you assemble and then So or Sa was like, yeah, you maneuver together, okay, like you move, you forward, yeah, move yeah. forward, and then So was like, I don't know, attack or some shit. I don't know <laughs> what it was, man. Did and but like. Did you recognize yourself on screen? Did you actually? I, watch I never watched that shit. Bro. You never watched it? I never watched that shit, dude. Bro. I would be recording it, screen capturing it, Apparently. sharing it, giving my IMDb page. An update, <laughs> like Apparently, every... they reshot everything, man. Oh, really? Yeah, man. So I was just like, all right, man. Whatever, you got your paid. I got hey, man. Got I, paid. That money matters. can't go there, yeah, man. Edmonton's weird because we don't get a ton of like we had Last of Us here, mm -hmm. but I remember the the biggest like production where they were asking for extras was a movie, Asif loves this movie. It's called Christmas in Wonderland. Have you ever heard of it? No. It was Patrick Swayze, Carmen Electra, and uh, uh, Chris Kattan. Uh -huh. And it's about like these kids who get lost in the mall during Christmas time. And it's like a this terrible, mall. yeah, yeah, West Edmonton Mall. It was like a terrible, like, B, was, the sad part about this is that it was Patrick Swayze's final movie before he passed away. Uh -huh. But I remember they were like always asking for extras for that movie, but... I'm sure Toronto's got a little bit better, uh, better scene, and Vancouver's got a little bit better yeah, scene yeah, for I've extra seen, work man. than yeah. uh, what we're struggling with here. That's yeah, true, man. I would be doing extra work in this cold ass weather, man. <laughs> Yo, it's like minus three right now. Why, why I mean, it's not that bad. It's, it's not beautiful. Bad. 
It I is heard, su- very sunny. I heard a quote you said about Edmonton once, which is, shit city, great people. I don't know, man. We got to we gotta change that perspective a little yeah, bit. Yeah, man. It's like, no, I mean, I think... Prime the, time? Come on, prime time. Pr- yeah. Food is great. <laughs> food is great. I think, like... I I I'll stand on that man. <laughs> I stand Bold. on that. Okay, keep some going. Of the, right, some of the it. best places to uh, some of the best places to live yeah. have the worst people. And some True. of the best pla- uh, some of the worst places and some of the worst places yeah. have the best people. That's what I find. The worst yeah. places bring out the good people. Uh, bring bring out the good in people. Yeah, you know what it is? I think Edmonton is unique because we're like a we're like a big little city, you know, a big little town right? mm-hmm. where it's like everybody's kind of knows each other and it's like a small enough community that like if you want to get something done, you're not competing with 50 other organizations. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's like, you know, it's it's got everything you need. Right. Yeah, and you we, also can't tarnish those relationships, man. There's only yeah. so few of you. <laughs> hey, man, we got like one one point two million. You know what I mean? There's so big, big. But if you live in a big city, be like, oh, man, I'll find like 10. <laughs> I'll find like ten other guys that like that are like oh you, man. Oh my goodness! Fair enough. That's how they move. They'll be like, oh man, it is. That's that's facts, though. I guess it's true. That's if you true. go to like even you go, oh man, and it's like oh, I imagine it's affordable living here. You haven't seen the ads all over Ontario, all over. Toronto? Oh yeah, telling people to Come move to Alberta, Edmonton, bro. To Let's go. Yeah, man, you can't afford. Like I was in, I was in Montreal. Yeah. And. Man, I was there in the summertime, and I saw a bunch of people, like, holding hands, like, old couples, middle-aged mm. couples, adolescent couples holding hands. I'm like, yo, it's love in the air, man? What's going on, man? Yeah. And then I realized they could afford to love, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? These guys are worried. These guys, you that's... know what the cost of living? You can get a one-bedroom apartment for, <laughs> that's massive, for, like, 1500 a month. In Montreal? In Montreal. You're living like really? a king. Yeah, you could run suicides in your basement, in your freaking apartment. <laughs> You get an apartment in, in, in Montreal, you could run suicides in that place, Damn, man. All right. But I'm like, yo, the reason why they could afford it because they could afford to love, man. There you they go. got the time to. There you in go. Toronto, you can't, man. No one's holding hands because no they can't afford hands, to. Man. <laughs> they can't afford it. That's that's a fact. Mm-hmm. That's a fact. Edmonton, man, you get hugs. You don't even. You, you can go beyond holding hands. See what I'm saying? You can hug each other. Embracing over here. each other, Embracing. man. It's about to look like India, man. All there the guys are gonna be holding hands too, man. <laughs> <laughs> India's like pinky hole. That's oh, a different story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so going going back, so so you get introduced to to, to stand ups through like audio, which is very very unique. Were you did you ever think like, man, I could do this when you were listening to it? Like, or was it just like was it part of your personality that you were kind of the class clown or like the clown in your family or anything? I was uh, I was like I had an idea that I could do it, but also, um, yeah, man, I just think I. Uh, in high school and elementary school, all of that stuff, I was just, I was mostly just trying to be myself, really, and have some fun with it. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd watch, like, funny things on TV, and I'd be like, oh, man, I'd probably think about at some point, like, I'm going to say this in school today. Hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I feel like everybody in their adulthood, like, when they, if they admire stand-up comedy, watch stand-up comedy, I think they've also prepared in their mind that, like, they've prepared mentally like a five minute set. If they, at worst comes to worst, like put you on the spot, put you on the spot. Yeah. Do five. I feel like everybody has that. I was living in that, that mindset for, uh, my whole life. Wow. Ready to go. Yeah. Specifically with like a set, like, did you actually have like five minutes crafted? Not five minutes, but like, like I mean, I don't mean like, you know, like you have it scripted, but like, if you if someone put you on the spot back in you know you're like 13 years old 14 years old you you'd be ready to go. Mm-hmm. So if I think about it this way: say like my mind is at a library and I have a bunch of stories in my yeah. in my library. As soon as like a keyword pops up like Google, there's like huh. six other stories. Like oh, say you bring up turtles. Oh man, f the turtles in my mind. I have a story about how much I hate turtles to be honest. And like it connected to that story could be like. The straws, paper straws, plastic straws yeah, connected yeah. to turtles. And then literally in my mind, there's probably like a weird ass Dewey Decimal System that just freaking <laughs> just goes boom. I don't even know how I know that word, but <laughs> that's an you know impressive I mean? but, throw, you know, call you it know? to the Dewey Decimal System. <laughs> Shout out to the Dewey, man. It was the Dewey. It was the Dewey. It was the Dewey. The Dewey, the Dewey Decimal System was before the Dewey, man. Okay. Now we refer to the Dewey I love as, it. A, as a head. Yeah, an African headscarf. We call that a dewey? Yeah, man, a do-rag. Yeah, I didn't know it was a short but now form there's of dewey. A, 
Now we're gonna we got to bring back the Dewey Decimal System. Man. <laughs> that's apparently that's the throwback. I like it. <laughs> yeah. I like it. I like it. Okay, so so after high school, you you moved to BC. That that was for for college and on a, on a basketball scholarship or what was the, What was the catalyst for that? Uh, I went to first, uh, I graduated from, when I graduated from high school, my grades were hot dog water, you know, not any good really. So, so tasty. Yeah, man. Yeah. Right on. Not, not, no, no, not tasty <laughs> okay, at all. It. They were, I don't know what he's eating, man. <laughs> Trenches. Uh, but, <laughs> but, um, but I was trying to sort things out. I went to the, uh, I went I, 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 I went back to high school, kind of just like upgrading my courses, hung out at the, uni- I was at the University of Waterloo, just hanging out over there. And then, then I went to BC right away because uh, one of my friends was at UBC, mm-hmm. who I graduated high school with, and he was like, oh shit, come on to Vancouver. And I went and I tried it out, met some cool people, and then I just uh, kind of never left, man. I'd, I'd stay there for like eight months. As soon as school was over, I'd go back to Toronto for four, mm-hmm. then rinse and repeat every year. And some summers I stayed, you know, longer than others. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But you you moved there and played basketball. I moved there to play basketball. Yeah. I went to the University of Cap- Capilano University. Okay, right on. Mm-hmm. And and when you did that, was it like, okay, this is like a pathway for me to maybe get you know post secondary education, or was it like, okay, I can double down on my efforts of trying to get basketball to become a thing? Like, what was your, or was it just have some buddies here and hang out in Vancouver for a few years? Uh, Vancouver was just kind of like a plus. Uh, initially, I really wanted to play basketball. I really wanted to move out west. I think I had a bunch of my friends. They were either going out east, out east, as far as like New Brunswick. Yeah. And I was actually supposed to go to the University of New Brunswick to play, but then I heard they get like ten inches of snow, and I was like, yeah, man, <laughs> not down. And then I went to, uh, and then a bunch of my friends they would only go as far as Alberta. Yeah. When they went west, so I was like, okay, let's go a bit further. Yeah. And yeah, man, I kind of fell in love with BC, man. And I was also like. Um, I think the school was a great place for me to like develop. I wasn't new to starting a new mm-hmm. in a new institution, school, team. Uh, I thought my style of play was very befitting to any program, mm-hmm. really. So I could hang with, I could adapt to any coach's style or whatever. And so, um, yeah, my basketball was just like the driving factor for it more than anything. Uh, school was a plus, yeah, you know, but yeah, I didn't. Yeah. I really didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. I started what, what off. What did you take? When you were there? I started off in uh, political science. Yeah, and then I haven't. After that, I was like, ah, like open studies. <laughs> yeah, man. I felt like I, I, political science. I realized, man, this was just, sucks, man. Yeah, <laughs> it really does suck. It's bad news every day. Yeah, every day bad news. There's no way you study political science and be like, yo, the world is such a great place. <laughs> You know what I mean? And then the thing is that you're also studying why the world is so cooked. Yeah. And then you're like, man, we got to switch up the recipe, but you have no pull in doing it. Unless like you're in the fields, Mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's some real house of cards type energy. I don't have, (laughs) I have too much humor in me to to be in the government. Yeah. Yeah, So I said, yeah, man, I don't think I was down for that. Uh, Then I took like general arts for a few years and then I was like, okay, I think everything that I'm studying leads towards uh this uh communications degree and i actually enjoyed it a lot man the study of media people's behavior Mm. uh while they engage with uh whether it be social news um uh, uh, social media news and everything else that is in between you know so yeah so while you're playing basketball you start you started vlogging your experience right yeah what what motivated you to do that i was already doing that in like high school man from an early age of like like 15, uh, my friend and I, my, I, I convinced one of my friends to like, like lend me his camera and I would just like borrow it and take it places like uh, to these AU tournaments. And yeah. and like, so I even have like archive footage of me and like when I was like 15 years old, dicking around with my boys and like in, in Pennsylvania, yeah. in Louisville, Kentucky, doing randomness, uh, hanging out, going to gas stations, just being in America, just young kids. So mm. I like, I always liked the idea of, capturing the essence of my youth and just for my own sake i didn't really want to be famous or anything like that i was just like oh man this is something i could look back to yeah now fast forward uh when i was when i left school for a minute i, I left school for a year uh i was volunteering with uh, my friend's uh basketball program it started off as dean up athletics then it transit it was like it's, it was a a youth basketball program um that was uh 
more so made for like inner city kids, predominantly like East African Muslim students, mm-hmm. uh, basketball players that were just like that played at a very high level, but necessarily didn't have the opportunities to play maybe for other teams and other programs where the fees were, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. extremely yeah, radical. Yeah. So, uh, so I used to coach with these kids, and all the time, like whenever we travel, I'd take my camera around and like film the experience and document the experience so I, I watched it turn from like yo why does this guy always have a camera and then the, the first video would drop and then be like yo the video is freaking <laughs> amazing man i love that and now now you have people following the story you know from xyz places you know enjoying it and uh i really enjoyed i really uh enjoyed capturing their the essence of their youth and now we're all much older yeah and uh, some of us have like gone on to play professionally. Um, uh, some of them are done playing basketball and working full time, mm-hmm. and they go back to those videos as like a digital time capsule. Yeah. To really like, oh man, remember what we did there? And I would never delete those videos or, or like, uh, uh, like remove them. Yeah, 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 yeah because yeah. it's like again, it's not even it's not even mine. It's yeah. theirs. No, that's amazing. So there was nothing where you were like. You know, this is something that I want to maybe pursue later. So I want to work on my craft. It was strictly like, hey, I want to capture this, just like taking photos of everyday life. That's yeah, like uh, but I wasn't like a, a photography enthusiast. I wasn't more of a a, a videographer as well. I I like the humor, and I mm. like I like humor, and I like memories, and I like creating both of those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. When it got to like, I think at one point when I was doing the social media thing, everyone everyone kind of came at me with like, not everyone, but a lot of people were coming at me with some sort of like, as if I had some sort of prestige, like, oh, you're supposed to be making X amount of money, you're a big time YouTuber. And I thought I was, I only had like <laughs> like 2,000 subscribers, man. <laughs> and so I was like, yeah, man, this is not a big time thing, really. I'm just like, uh, for shits and giggles. But then um, I really didn't feel like there was like any genius in it. You know, I mean, there is. You know, but to geniuses to to who was ever creating it, right? Mm-hmm. And um, it wasn't until like I put that I put that part of my life aside for a bit, yeah, just so I could focus on one thing and one thing only. Because maybe I, I by the time I was like twenty five, and um, I hit that like TSN turning point in my life where I was like I was doing ball half ass, I was doing school half ass, I was doing uh, YouTube half ass. Comedy half ass, relationships half ass, everything half ass. Mm. So I was like, okay, let me put my eggs in, in one basket for a, a period of time, for the first time in a long time, um, because I was very finicky with what I wanted to do. I was like, oh man, do I, I want to play basketball, but I also want to do a stand up comedy. But jack of all, you know, doing too much. Yeah, yeah, you're stretching yourself too. Yeah, thin. stretching myself too. Thin. So what was the determining factor to pursue comedy then? Um. I like to think like a lot of people say that you know when they start I mean, a lot of comics I think when they start they'll be like oh man I love making people laugh and yeah you know I just love making people that's 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 their their uh, like reason why yeah and I thought that would have been like at first but like honestly it's just something I'm good at man fair enough you know what I mean and I think rarely do 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 people find something that they're good at mm-hmm. and they take it and they run with it especially like young black men you know we were always like oh, okay you know what let's go find this job and just like put that shit aside and yeah follow this but like if you find something that you're good at and you're passionate about man just go towards it man how did the how did the people around you react to that decision because you, you left your basketball kind of career before your senior year right mm-hmm. was did you get pushback from those around you or was it more support um, a little, a little bit of pushback, man. I remember my 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 coach at the time, and he's still like a good friend of mine. Uh, no animosity towards him, but I remember, uh, I was in my last year of university, and like we had a really good team. Yeah. And I was honestly, I was in the best shape of my life. I think my perform like, and I really like going into your fifth year in the same league. It really does make a difference, you know. Uh, in terms, it's like. <laughs> it sounds really stupid, but it's like repeating the third grade. Yeah. 
You know what I mean? Like you're it, really good. At you're gonna be you're gonna be really good at it the <laughs> second time, man. So like now I've repeated the third grade four times. Yeah. You know, and now I'm going into my fifth. I'm like I'm about to dominate this shit and have yeah. a good time at it while I'm at it. But at the same time, I, I hit that same TSN turning point where I was like, man, I'm doing too much, man. Yeah. And I and, and I was yeah, man. And uh, I thought about it, man. I'm like, yo, if I could dedicate five years of my life to do something. Uh, I want to do for the next 30, 40, then I should be in a good place. Mm-hmm. And I had that conversation with my my coach and uh, it was kind of like, oh man, just like you can kind of just do, do just finish this year and then do that, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. But I feel like as a man, you should like be able to draw a line in the sand at some mm-hmm. point. Make a, make a decision, stand on it. And that was the first time I, I, I had done that in a long time in my life where I was like, I want to do school. I want to do basketball. I want to hang out with my friends. I want to do all that. But this is when it when I made that decision to like, okay, I want to do stand up. It was the first time I was like, okay, something's got to go, mm-hmm. and that was it. Would you say the decision at that time in your mind was it more short term or long term? It was long term, and yeah. it was the first time I've made like basketball was the first long term decision I made when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna make it to the NBA. Yeah, that was like my first like dream. Yeah. You know, and that carried me all the way to who I am now uh, and up until university as well. So comedy is the same thing as well. I would love to think like I'm going to go, you know, I'm not trying to just be here till I'm like 30 and be like retire, you know, because that's funny, man. I talk to like if you talk to students now. Yeah. I talked to this one girl, man. She's like, uh, I want to become a doctor. She's, she's in medical school. She's in med, uh, med school. Yeah. She said, oh, man, I want to retire when I'm 35. I said, you don't really want to be a doctor then. You know what I mean? Like, you don't start making money until you're 30 when you're a doctor. So good yeah. luck with that. Yeah. Well, yeah, man, you really don't want to even be a doctor. Man. I wouldn't want to be your patient. You know what I mean? <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like, I I would love to think like I'm, I'm trying to, I'm aspiring to be here for a long time. Man. My goal is to blow up when I'm 50. Right on. You know, so if anything, you guys are here mad early, man. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are here too early, man. I'm trying to blow up at 50, man. So, yeah. <laughs> No, but that's a, that's an interesting way of putting it. I remember having a conversation with uh, with with Hamza Huck about this, where he was like, you know, he was like, I want to be like Oscar Isaac, right? Where my biggest hits are in my forties, not not right now, right? Mm-hmm. Grind, make your make your path so that by then you're well respected, and then you can start really collecting. But yeah, I feel like today in today's day and age, and I mean, you see this more than anybody because mostly, you know, a lot of how you've built your following has been through social media and through TikTok, which is like such instant hits, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like today, that's kind of how society lives. It's like in the moment. It's like, how do you create a moment that is going to go viral like now? Mm -hmm. Not how do you build something over the course of a career? So how do you... How do you balance those two? Like, how do you how do you stay focused on like, okay, I'm here for the long term, but also recognizing that like the way in which today's society works is so much based on instant gratification. Um, I don't know, man. You have to have like, um, I guess, proper regimen, routine, and like a firm identity. But also, there's so many things, so many things that. Try not to play to the algorithm. There's so many different ways yeah. like, I, I can imagine answering that question, <laughs> but uh, man, just kind of staying true to it, man. Yeah. Just staying true it, to it. Is it like, is it a mindset where you have to say like, okay, look, I've, like, do you, do you have like a long-term plan for yourself where you're just kind of taking what comes? I'm kind of, I've been taking it what comes, man. Yeah. Uh, I'm very present, alhamdulillah, man, like in terms of just uh being focused on where i am right now because if i if i'm focused I, there was times like even when i was like playing ball yeah uh everybody's like hey when you're playing ball everyone's like oh man after post-secondary i'm done i'm gonna go uh i'm gonna go play pro or something like that but it never really happens not all not very few you know what it takes to go pro oh my god a lot like not and even just like in these the if you're playing in like a third division in yeah, france or whatever still. you're still a professional athlete yeah. and you're it takes a lot of dedication. You can't fake the funk. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the stage is some place where you can't do that either. And yeah. it's very transparent. And you could tell, like, who's been cooking and who hasn't, who's been, who's seasoned and who's dry. Yeah, yeah. You know? Um, and I think knowing that in comedy, people could tell. Yeah. It's, it keeps me 
on my on my point. But I don't really. Uh, I, I'm just really just trying to take it one step at a time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So okay. So so going back to like that decision point where you were like, okay, I'm gonna focus on comedy. What was the I heard that like early on, early on, maybe you still do this. You you try to shadow people that were coming through Vancouver, see all their sets. Like, what was your what was your game plan at that time? Like, was it just get as much stage time as possible, or you you said you listened to the the DMAC episode where he was like, I just watched comedy for a year before he felt comfortable to get on stage. Like, what 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 path did you take at that at that stage? Um, so there's a uh, there's like a Jamaican proverb. I don't know if you guys are familiar, but it's like it's like if you want to be hot, stand next to the fire. Mm. So Vancouver is a place where a lot of headliners would kind of like drop into the city. Yeah. So I'd buy tickets, man. Even like as a as a comic, even though you was, I wasn't like as known in the scene early on. But I just go and I'd watch. I'd watch Godfrey yeah. a weekend. He was there. I'd watch um, uh, Roy Woods Jr. come in for a weekend. I'd just watch every single show. Yeah. Just hang out in the back and. Uh, again, being a student, even when I opened for Hassan Minaj, I bought two tickets. <laughs> I bought two tickets for both shows, one ticket for each show. Somehow I ended up backstage and somehow um, I ended up asking him for stage time and somehow it ended up happening. So, okay, so back that up. So how did that, wh where did you see him? Like, where did you buy tickets for? And then how did that translate into you opening for him? So what happened was I was in Toronto. Uh, I was in Toronto. I had just moved there. Uh, from Vancouver, and, and what what years? Is, what years? Is this, this is twenty twenty one or twenty twenty two. Okay, recently. Yeah. No. Yeah. Twenty twenty one. Okay. Or it was like twenty. Yeah, I don't know. Recently. Recently. Okay. It was like, <laughs> uh, when he was doing uh, he, and he was doing the Queen Elizabeth at the Vogue. So what ended up happening was, I, uh, my friend Dino Archie, who's friends with Hassan Minaj. Yeah. Uh asked me to open for him in Victoria, BC. Okay. And I I had already bought tickets for the same time, that same weekend Hassan was doing it, the 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 Queen Elizabeth Theater in Vancouver. Yeah. Dino was doing the uh, shows in Victoria uh -huh. on the Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday was Hassan. Right? Yeah. So now fast forward. Saturday he was in Seattle, which I was at that show. Okay, yeah, boom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, there the, you go. the timeline works. Yeah. And so what happened was Dino... Uh, asked me to open for him. I said, hell yeah. So I booked my flight uh, to go to Vancouver when, and I already forgot that I purchased these tickets for Hassan's show uh, months in advance. Like when it dropped, I bought the tickets. I bought yeah. two for, uh, I bought two, one for each show because I was going to sit down and just... In Vancouver. In Vancouver. Yeah, yeah. Right? So the fact that I get to go work in Vancouver, uh, in Victoria with Dino, yeah. and then go watch Hassan after, it was like, okay, two birds, one stone. Totally. So I get I get to Vic, uh, I get to Vancouver, I take the ferry over with uh, with Dino, and him and I are chopping it up. Uh, turns out the first show that we were supposed to do got canceled. Um, or uh, it turns out the, the show that I thought I was opening for Dino, uh, they already had an opener. Oh. So they asked me to host. Okay. Right? And so... Hosting is like not the most fun, you yeah. know, for most comments. I'm not the strongest host either, but you know, I'm already here. Let's do the, uh, let's take, I'll take the time anytime. So I end up hosting. Uh, so the first show goes great, right? Uh, the second show now, I, this is like one of my first times like really traveling for a show. So yeah. I forget about this three hour time difference. <laughs> so it's about like one, one, a, it's about like 2 a.m. in the morning for me. And as I'm bringing up the headliner, which is Dino, and and I I brought him up very lazy. Mm -hmm. Right, he gave me an assignment. He said, "Yo, just say that you've seen him on Jimmy Kimmel Live, and he's doing the comedy extravaganza, Van City extravaganza in Vancouver, January eighth uh, at the Vogue Theater. Say those two things." I bring him up, and I say none of that. I say, oh, "Yo, this guy Dino Archie, man. He at the time he had a tour called yeah. Toxic but Safe." I said, oh, man, this guy, he's toxic, but he's safe. Make some noise for my boy Dino Archie. He comes up. He goes, Hassan, come back up stage, on the stage. Puts his hand on my shoulder, says, that has to be the worst introduction <laughs> I've ever had in my life. I said, oh, shit, my bad, yo. And I get off stage, and I think, like, the crowd was like, oh, you know. But, like, everyone, I think anybody would have, like, any other comic, they probably would have been like, oh, man, this guy's, like, 
so mean or something like that. Nah, but Dino's that's Dino. And yeah, on top yeah. of that, like I rather you tell me from now than let me make a mistake like that ever again. Totally. You know, so him and I are just chopping it up afterwards in the hotel. And I said, Oh, are you I asked him, I said, Are you going to Hassan Minaj's show? And he goes, Oh yeah, I'm opening. <laughs> there you go. I said, Word? He goes, Yeah, man, you should come through, man. Like backstage where we come through. And I am like, I'm like giddy. You yeah. know, like no way this is a thing. Now fast forward. Uh, <laughs> I, while I'm on the ferry, he tells me like, while we're on the ferry, I'm trying to sell these tickets, man. I just, <laughs> I just spent like 350 yeah, bucks no on, on two tickets for the same show. I was like, yeah, I'm That's trying awesome. to, I'm, on, I'm online, kind of like, yo, I got two tickets. Who wants them? You know, no one ended up buying them, but my seats uh, were way better. So what happened is now we finally get to the venue, and I guess like Hassan was just coming in, and I didn't even understand, but like Dino, luckily, you know, as a uh, as somebody who was guiding me through that moment, he yeah. was just like, he just uh, introduced us. Yeah. Uh, introduced us and then let him go about his way because he has a job to do, right? Of course. And so uh, there was two openers, Asif and Asif, Asif Ali. Ali, yeah. Asif Ali and Hassan uh, and, and Dino, Dino Archie. Yeah. And so what happens is uh, Dino did 10, Asif did 10, and, and then Hassan brought him, uh, came up. Yeah. And that was for the first show. And I was just chilling in the backstage, just watching yeah. the whole thing. And then after the first show was done, uh, Hassan, Dino, and I are, are chilling. And then some, there was some word around, like, the with the AD talking, someone saying, like, yeah, oh, yeah. Asif, you got to leave, right? Because Asif had to do another show, another show in New yeah. Westminster. Right. And so I heard that just through, I was like, oh, man, opportunity. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. You know what I mean? And that's my that's our boy Kashif Pasta and his team that produced that show. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kashif was there. Exactly. I actually hollered yeah. at Kashif. Kashif's a man, man. I hollered at Kashif. I said, yo, I actually hollered at Kashif before the show. And I said, yo, listen, man, I'm trying to open it. And then he's like, oh, I think nobody ever got back to me. So I was like, <laughs> Yeah, nobody ever got back to we me. We will let Kashif know. Yeah, yeah let Kashif know, man. Back. I hollered at him. And he's just yeah. like, he left me on yeah. he left me on scene, man. <laughs> and then I showed up on the scene and I there saw him. And I said, and he's like, Oh yeah, I thought you I said, Yeah, man. Nigga, I'm here. I'm activated, man. There you go, Trust man. me. And so, <laughs> and so, uh, fast forward now. Asif leaves, right? It's uh, Dino, Hassan, and I, and we're just chopping it up cordially. And then Dino goes out to smoke. Hassan goes to the bathroom. And but before Dino leaves, Hassan gets up first, and then Dino and I are here sitting there talking. And I asked Dino, I said, "Yo." You brought me back here. I don't want to overstep, but I was going to ask you, is it cool if I ask Hassan for, for some time? You know? I love it. And he goes, I mean, Dino's a real one, man. This guy goes, yeah, yeah, for sure. You can. I'm not going to ask for you, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you, you got to do that. Yeah, yeah, you exactly. got to shoot. Your and I was like, yeah, man, no problem. I wasn't even like, yeah, I was going to totally do it myself, <laughs> you know? And so Dino goes out to smoke. I, uh, I, I'm spinning the block through all this big ass theater and I run into Hassan and him and I uh, are in this in the green room alone and we're chopping it up for like 10-15 minutes man talking about my life really I think he was just trying to preserve his voice to be honest but <laughs> <laughs> him and I are just chopping it up for 15 minutes and in that time not to say that I was I wasn't enjoying the moment but like you don't have like while that conversation was holding on, you don't know how to transition into like asking for something. Mm -hmm. And also like, it's always weird asking for something. You also want to be weird asking for something. Yeah, you don't you know, like, like you're overstepping. Or overstepping yeah, and yeah. stuff like that. And so I was just like, I never got to it. 15 minutes mm -hmm. of talking, never got to it. And so uh, Dino walks back in and the AD walks in right after him. She goes, Dino, uh, we're ready. You guys ready to get started? And, he, and they're like, yep. Yeah. Dino, you're cool to do 20? And Dino looks at me and looks back at the AD and he goes, yep. Damn. And, and walks towards the bathroom, gives, uh, AD gives Hassan like the thumbs up and they were good. They were like about to get, get it going. And then I stood up, I said, yo, Hassan, I, I know we were, we were talking and I was just gonna ask you, I was like, is it cool if I do like even five or is there, is there any time I could do any? And he goes, oh man, I wish you asked me sooner. And I was like, you know, like, I was like, oh, man, you know, uh, I was going to ask you, but, like, I didn't really know. Like, you know when yeah. a girl, like, when you're asking a girl out and you're, like, so <laughs> nervous, and you're you like, know. oh, like, I was going to, you know, but if you don't want to go out with me, it's fine, you know. <laughs> you know I wouldn't want to go out with me. We can still be friends. Yeah, yeah we can cool. still be friends. Yo, I don't want to go out with me either, too. Like, my shirt's, I, I don't know, I was, talking, I was talking, I was rambling. 
And I was like, yeah, man, it's cool. And then he's like, you know what? I think he was just trying to stop me from talking. He's like, you know what? Give me a second. And maybe it clock clocked in his head because like at least Dino brought me. Said he said he's funny. So I was like, okay. So the AD goes upstairs, and Hassan's like, yo, let me go get the AD. And uh, Hassan goes up the stairs, and but the AD actually just turned the corner where we were just standing. And she goes, where's Hassan? I said, oh, he's upstairs. He's looking for you. They I let them find each other, and then the AD comes back downstairs, and they and, and she goes, you're cool to do five. And I was like, yeah, no problem. Boom, yeah, I'm amped. And then Kashif came out of nowhere, actually. He's like, yo, we got you. I said, like, nigga, <laughs> we got you the spot, man. I was like, nigga, I did that, man. Uh, that's awesome. You know? <laughs> I was like, I did that shit, man. But, and then it was, it, was very, it was a very surreal moment for me uh, because, yo, it was, you know, because he did the ghost call, the phantom call from the back, yeah. and I went first. And now... Before that, now before even going on the stage, we were doing like shotgun style or like piggyback style, mm -hmm. where one comic brings up the next, yeah, right. And I was gonna bring up Dino, but now the last time I brought up Dino, oh yeah, I was I I fried him, you yeah, know, and yeah, he yeah. fried me. I I cook, I brought him up lazy, and yeah. then he fried me, yeah. And so he looked at me, he goes, "Listen, <laughs> when you get on stage, when you're done your set, just say you've seen him on Jimmy Kimmel Live, and he's doing the Van City Extravaganza at the Vogue Theater, January 8th. I said, I got you. I go up, I do five minutes, finish my set. I said, this comic, you've seen him on Jimmy Kimmel Live. You're going to see him do the Van City Extravaganza at the Vogue Theater, January 8th. Make some noise for my friend, Dino Archie. Crowd goes crazy. He comes up. We dap each other. He whispers, you killed that shit, my <laughs> <laughs> And then... And then I was like, yo, this was just crazy, man. And like Hassan brought me up on stage too, which it felt like I was like, yo, he's like, it felt like, you know, if imagine you're you're in the the Brickley gym or whatever, you know, Chris Brickley who does like uh the the open gym runs in the summer yeah, the summertime yeah, yeah, yeah. workouts. Yeah. And like imagine you're in the gym and like LeBron James is like, yo, we need five. We need one more. <laughs> you wanna jump in? But except I was like, yo, take me. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Man. And that's what happened, man. And yeah, I think moments are mo moments. Obviously, you know that's that's been in my barcode, really. You yeah. know, pulling up Dave Marhez is the first comic that ever like gave me time of day as well in terms of like I slid in <laughs> his DMs like a year. He's the most come. receptive guy in the world when it comes to sliding into his DMs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's, he's awesome. With <laughs> he's with it, man. I said, "Yo, Dave, is there?" And he's like, "Yeah, for sure." And at the time, I was selling merch like earlier on in comedy. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. He was the he was the first person. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, man. What, have you found, generally speaking, that the community has been very receptive to new comics, or like, it, and with you specifically, or has it been a little more competitive? Like, you found like a little more sharp, sharp elbows, or uh, both, or no? I feel like, man, you you get in where you fit in, you know, and if you fit in, then you're getting in, and I like to think that I'm uh, I'm fitting in and where I belong. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's all that matters at the end of the day. If you uh -huh. feel like you're part of the community, right? Uh -huh. um, I wanted to go back a little bit to. Uh, Sorry, that to, was a long story. No, but that was great, man. That was awesome. That's that's fantastic uh -huh. story, and I love that we got to roast Gosha a little bit. Today, so <laughs> nothing wrong with that. Uh, I love Gosha, but it's okay. Um, so I want to go back a little bit to what we, we touched on before, which is your uh, your your TikTok presence, which is kind of you know very successful. You've been uh, been able to translate. Uh, using TikTok to to gain quite a following, where, where do you how do you see that as a platform? Is that just like another form of social media, or do you have to be a little bit more intentional around the type of content that you're putting out on TikTok? Um, uh, TikTok is a fun place, man. I feel like uh, with with TikTok, it it's a whole new audience, man. Uh, that they're able to perceive it the way it is, man. It's yeah. like it's a very good place for like a, a first impression mm. instagram is very performative you it's know what i mean yeah and this is coming from a guy who's uh, studied communications man uh <laughs> he's a pro uh, i'm a pro man trust me no man instagram is very performative man it's like a lot of people telling you um like it's a lot of like congratulate it's a, it's like a digital resume or digital yeah uh, portfolio yeah, more yeah, so yeah. whereas tiktok is kind of like raw like it, a lot of like burner accounts to tell you what it is like in the comment and i respect that man i respect that man it's like the it's 
at first it was very uh, first impression. Now it's kind of it's becoming a little bit more refined as people are learning not only how to use it but also to consume it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but I do take time with the, the the content. Like I'm I'm the one like cutting up these clips. You yeah, know what I mean, and I think that's the that's the era of comedy that we're in now where. Uh, not to say that it was any different than entirely before, like when Hassan was starting, because Hassan was doing YouTube videos, the yeah, whole shebang, right? Yeah. So, uh, but now it's uh, now you're also like trying to figure out how to cr- like create art within the algorithm, mm. and when you start creating uh, art for the for the algorithm, man, it's you just feel like a a worker bee, yeah, you know, yeah, and it yeah. sucks. But if you're starting creating art. And it just happens to like work with the uh, work with the media or social media, then, yeah. or the algorithm, yeah. Then it's cool. Do you have to find you you find yourself catching yourself to be like, oh, if I said this, it might go viral, and you have to be like, no, no, I gotta stay true to myself. I'm not gonna just say something for the sake of like getting clicks. Honestly, man, I've been I've gone viral a few times before, like even inst- yeah, before inst- uh, before uh, like even TikTok as yeah. well. And man, that level of dopamine is just like nothing beats real life. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because you can go viral, man. You come home and your parents will just roast you. <laughs> it's so humbling. You know what I mean? <laughs> totally. You know? And I think I've, I've already, I'm quite familiar with that. Like even after I opened for Hassan Minaj, my dopamine level was insane. That's yeah. the first time I stood in front of like what, 3,000 people or some yeah, shit like absolutely. that. And then we you know what I did after? I took public transit, man. There you go. You know, I took public transit late night all the way to New Westminster. <laughs> you know how deep that was, man? My <laughs> dopamine level was like, it went it went straight from this. I didn't even have bus fare, man. I did fair evasion, man. I freaking oh, jumped man. the fence, man. <laughs> I jumped the fence. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm out here. So like uh, understanding where, rea- I think understanding the difference between your avatar yeah and your real life is a that's where the the where simplicity is mm. you know and if you start trying to live your avatar in real life oh man it doesn't yeah don't buy your own hype yeah yeah, what yeah. You're saying. yeah yeah exactly was it uh equally as as a dopamine hit when drake started following you oh no uh yeah but also i i i uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, Drake followed me, man. That was pretty crazy, man. I was actually I was opening for my 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 boy um uh Sahib Singh yeah. in Toronto. Yeah. And he was yo, that guy freaking shut down Toronto, man. He did uh five shows, wow, two nights uh yeah, at the comedy bar on Danforth. And man, it, man, he afforded me the opportunity to open for him and kind of like even promote my own comedy special at his show while I was doing, man, and I I'm grateful for that. But literally in between the shows. Uh, that's when it happened. I was like, I went to the, <laughs> I got off the stage. I, I, I did what I do after the show. I hang out in the, in, in the lobby and I just kind of like shake hands, kiss babies and, and let people know that I got a show yeah. coming up. And I went back to my phone charging in the green room and I saw that. I thought it was a burner account, to be honest. <laughs> you know what I mean? Something like alias account. like yeah, some fake thing. And, Poppy, yeah. and I was just like, I saw that. And then I just, you know, I, I, I went outside. I took a lap on the downforth, man. I was just <laughs> I took a lap on the downforth, and I think the best part about it was because I had a show right after. I had to like there were that was in between shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that devil of dopamine already was like was like if I went to bed that night and just been like, yo, I'm out here, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you I would have it would have been on I would have been on some like just happy to be here type beat. Yeah. But no, I think that again, get it when you fit in, and like also, it's that's what's supposed to happen, man. You know, I I'm grateful. You know, I'm not this not coming like in an arrogant way, but like that's what. You're in this format to like, uh, you know, if people are able to to vibe with the energy that you're putting out, man, mm-hmm. it's I'm, I'm just grateful that it's well received. And yeah, man. And after that, I just did another show. <laughs> I did another show open for my boy Sahib. I had a great time. I pretended it didn't happen. Really? I was going to ask, did you bring it up in your show? No, not at all. I was like, I was like, I let me go do what I love, man. And I think that's why everybody's kind of grabbing towards, gravitating towards me. So... There you go. That's perfect. That's I think perfect. when you when you put together your show, when you put your together your set, because a lot of a lot of the things that you put out on your social media, which again, like you said, you're the one who's cutting it up, is a reflection of you naturally, right? Which mm-hmm. means your culture, your religion, everything like that. How how do you ever feel, feel a sense of, of of responsibility around the fact that you are representing, 
your culture, your religion. I mean, not representing in the sense of like you're a spokesperson, but but just naturally. I mean, you know, that is part of who you are. So is that something that you have to consciously or ever or ever do consciously think about when you put together your material? Uh, not really, man, to be honest. Because then if you just, uh, I'm, I like, again, I'm not really in it for the people in the mm -hmm. sense I've, I've already been in it for myself. Yeah. This is the most selfish thing I've ever done in my life, you know? And uh, the moment I start doing it for people, I'm going to have a lot less fun. Yeah. You know, yeah, and my yeah. goal is to have a lot more fun. But I also, I, I guess you got to be mindful of like the, like you are representing and in that regard. But that's not my responsibility. You know, I think uh, uh, I put it this way, man. When I was in Sudan, I was hanging, I, I was, I'm not even Sudanese, but I was, I was hanging out in Sudan. And the first two weeks I was there, I didn't tell nobody I was there. You know, mm. I was just big chilling. I was hanging out with my boy's uncle every day. You know, it, it wasn't like, oh, you, you're going to hang out with me for a few hours and then you go hang out with your friends. It's like, no, nah, you're here every day. You're my, you, you are an extension of me today. You mm. know, put your phone away. And so I watched this guy, I watched this guy engage with his, uh, with, with his, his children, his wife, his uh, community. When I say community, I mean like the people on the, uh, on the street, the people he employs, his businesses, all of that. You know, and personally, that was the probably the I, my father not in my life uh, to the extent of like most most dual parent families. Yeah. But I was like, yo, this is the best representation I've seen in a long time. You know, at a face value. So I'm like, man, I never really held any. I never held forever. Like I, I, I never. Per, I personally, I never held uh, a public figure. To like a high regard, uh, to like a high a, regard like a, in the sense, like, oh, like yeah, that. this yeah. is where I'm supposed, like, uh, you know, I, I like that I've held public servants, yeah, you know, to a high regard, man. The people who who worked in the community center I grew up in, yeah. you know, people from my neighborhood, those guys have like have had way more impact, uh, have way more impact tangibly in my life, and I think understanding that. Hopefully, I can impact other people that way, but not not to the regard like oh, like you know, I personally I don't like. I think if if you're a Muslim, cool. To be honest, if mm -hmm. you're if you're Arab, East African, Desi, your mom knows my mom. We wear the same shoes. Those are all cool things, and yeah. I lives for the reason. But I think the quality of your character, ikhlaq, is mm -hmm. the most important thing mm -hmm. going forward with anything. So. Uh, if that's the, any type of representation that you're, if anybody watching this should be looking for, look at the content of somebody's character yeah. moving forward. Mm. And mm. that's where you should find representation. Perfect. In, in terms of the audience you're trying to build, is it, because right now, you know, you mentioned that, uh, or actually maybe I should ask you, do you feel like you've got a specific audience or do you think that you've got a little bit more of a wide range in, in the communities that you you find yourself in front of like is the crowd does the crowd look pretty diverse or uh it's it's definitely diverse it's become like uh okay I'm trying to figure out the best way to that okay when i first started comedy uh in my first like two years i didn't tell anybody that i was doing they knew that i was doing comedy yeah i never i i i told them where i was i never told them where i was going mm. people from my community or whatever so they knew that I was seeing because I, I innately from year one, I knew that the goal of a stand up comedian and the job of a stand up comedian is to make strangers laugh. Yeah. Right. So if I was making my friends, just my friends and people from my community laugh, that's what the that's what the group chat is for, really, yeah, to be honest, no doubt. you know. No doubt. So uh, with moving forward with comedy so far, then I started servicing my own. Uh, I started servicing uh, again, getting in where I do fit in, and you know, it started off when I started producing my own show. Uh, I'm trying to figure out the chronologically how to answer this question. So when I first started off doing comedy, it was in Vancouver, and I was making any. I'd go, I do comedy the traditional way, any comedy clubs or whatever, and my friends booking shows, whatever. And then when I moved back to Toronto, where the umma is a lot more. Uh, where I'm, which one is where I'm from, and also the Muslim community that I'm familiar with, and they're familiar with me. Mm -hmm. They were there, so. Um, so you start to develop more of that 
niche within the Muslim community or what? It wasn't even a niche. I was still doing the same thing I was doing. Yeah. Except the only difference is they were showing up now. No, you enough. know, I was giving them a reason to pull up to the comedy yeah, clubs, yeah, pull yeah, up yeah. to... And also comedy is done in like these dingy ass places, man. Freaking <laughs> comedy, like bars, lounges, nightclubs, whatever it may be. And so you had, I had Muslims pulling up to these venues, man. <laughs> and it was like, and some people were messaging me, yo, I want to come out and I want to support but like I don't want to be in those places, and I said that's fair. Um, and also, I wasn't even like doing a lot of time in those places. Mm. You know, I only had I was doing like ten minutes, and also I was getting paid. Why would comics get paid? <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, and so I was like, okay, let me take the initiative and start booking my own venues, and inviting people, and see who actually pulls up. Right on. And that's been the steady growth uh, so far. So it started off with the Muslim community, right? And uh, and on a not from an organizational standpoint, where like I'm working with like Islamic Relief, and right. These Muslim organizations, because those guys buy in later. That's why I realized early on. This is not me like sm throwing some smut on them, but this is the <laughs> truth. Muslim, like if you look, you go at Islamic Relief, Muslim, whatever, maybe I'm hey, sorry, now. Kind of, hey, I'm sorry, to, I'm not, the, we support early. No, bro. no, you guys support early. You guys yeah. supported early from from the from the from the year before. But a lot of these other organizations, man, I look at it, man. They like uh, they jump onto what's known. They jump onto what's known, and that's yeah. fair to be honest, because it is a business, even though they are yeah. nonprofit organizations, but. <laughs> Uh, hello, hello. But anyways, I, it, it started off very East Af To put it this way, it be it started off with the East African community, then the Arab community, or the Desi community, and everybody else kind of started. And now it's like comedy is such a secular thing, man. Mm. Anybody and everybody should come through, enjoy, laugh, and I've, that's the goal, really. You know, I want everybody to come through and just have a good time. And if I, uh, if it feels like like that could be a thing with me uh, on stage then hell yeah man the idea that you could, you could i've been inviting people to random addresses not even an establishment that's an actual comedy club just uh, <laughs> Pull up uh to spot. yeah man i found this space on i found this space on kijiji you know what i mean let's Amazing. freaking come here i'll set up the chairs i'll set up the audio equipment and we'll come through and have a laugh you know cut out these uh these other extremities that i want to get in the way and like eat as well, which is fine. I want them to eat, but yeah, also yeah. like, yeah, you don't work. need a two drink minimum if you don't need a two drink minimum. Bro, you know, imagine I, you know what, the, you know how stressful that is. Like, uh, imagine like booking a venue and like, ah oh, man, you don't have a crowd that drinks. Yeah. So you're left with a fifteen hundred dollar tab. Jeez. You're like, damn. And like, yeah. And also like when you don't even, <laughs> you can't even sell hard tickets like that. Yeah, man. In the early beginning, man. I one thing, man. The the work gets harder. Uh, the work is in the beginning is way harder and the margins are way smaller but the, I hope that the work gets uh, easier and the margins get bigger along the way but that being said even like I, 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 after shooting this special a lot of this word of mouth in Toronto Toronto is the best city in the world I put that on everything it is the best city in the world man the very beloved people um, uh they were, were with the East Africa community, especially man. We're all we're all like in this. We're all pioneers, putting ourselves in a position where we could benefit each other. I see this a lot in the Desi community. Say if I needed an MRI or whatever. Luckily, I know a few Desi guys that work in in medicine. I could holla at them. Yeah, you know, be like, yo, listen, I need an oil change or whatever it may be. <laughs> that it's like uh, it's like uh. It's not colluding or like no, nepotism. It's, it's more so yeah, you're lending it. You're supporting, a, each, you're other supporting each other, yeah. man. And a lot of East Africans, we're just getting our foot in the door in a lot of these places, and we're able to. We're we're getting into the point where getting to the point where we're able to help each other. And I personally have received that uh, with people taking the shot with me in terms mm -hmm. of like, yo, come through and have a laugh. And then if there's somebody else that's there, you can meet. I don't know, but that's what it feels like. It's very beloved. And I'm grateful tenfold. Amazing, man. Okay, before we wrap, we've got a couple of rapid fire questions. For sure. Yeah, let's do this. All right, here we go. First thing that comes to your mind. No right or wrong answers, just whatever it is, all right? Uh -huh. First one, what's your most rewatched movie? Uh, Antoine Fisher. Okay, okay. What's your most regrettable purchase? Uh, I bought um, I bought Nike Cortez's in, in, in Europe, and I spent euros on it, and my dog, and like 100 euros. And my boy's like, are you an idiot, man? You can freaking buy that in Canada for 80 euros, man. I was like, yo, I'm so stupid. 
<laughs> and you get to pack it. Yeah, man. That was so dumb, man. So that's, you know what? Relatively speaking, not the not the, not the biggest mistake. We've mm-hmm. had some crazy ones, but that's not bad. Mm. What's the first concert you ever attended? Uh, first concert I ever. It could be even a stand-up show. Uh, I don't really do con. Do I haven't done too many concerts. Uh, or done any really that I could think of. Uh, comedy show. Uh, live. Who do I see? Uh, I can't. Yeah, Roy, Roy <laughs> okay. was junior. Okay. All of that was like all in the same. Yeah, year. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll we'll pivot it. We'll pivot. Yeah, yeah. It. What was the what's the what's the one? And I think I know the answer. Oh no, me. Lion King. I saw Lion King. Lion King. We'll, live we'll, musical. That'll count. that'll count. Yeah, live and King live and musical is freaking amazing. There Anyways. you go. Was that in New York or where was that? Uh, that was in Toronto. I was a kid. It was nice. fantastic. Amazing. What's the one stand up special everyone has to watch or listen to in your uh, life? Killing Them Softly. There you go. I, I figured that would be the one. And then last but not least, what's the best anime character of all time? Naruto. All right. There you go. There you have it. Man, that sounds a pleasure, dude. Where can people find you and your work? Uh, you can find me at Hassan Phil's. Um, uh, HassanFills.com if you want to find me uh, in your city yeah, let me know in the email list whatever we're trying to figure out where in the world I should go and do comedy man so uh, I'll definitely pull up on you um, Twitter Hassan Fills or Pandemic Poppy <laughs> <laughs> Pandemic's over but I'm still Poppy uh, <laughs> um, uh, what else yeah that's about it man and uh, what are the plans for the special Any any estimated drop date or distribution method that people should be looking out for or still tbd tbd all right you can't say it that's fine that's fine love it okay man thank you again this is such a pleasure my pleasure brother thank you man thank you we hope you enjoyed today's episode of the halal gap stay tuned for more episodes and follow our brand new instagram page at the halal underscore gap the halal gap is a moscars production you can find the moscars on instagram facebook twitter and tiktok by searching moscars film festival Thank you to our sound and video editor, Vikram Chauhan, our tile artist, Narmin Sayed, and our producer, Asif Qureshi. Please rate us on Apple Sp- Podcasts and Spotify. And if you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments about our podcast, you can email asif at themoskers.com. On behalf of Sikander and myself, thank you for joining us. Catch you next time.